Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I'm back not just with the last wrap up of 2021, talking about the books that I read in the second half of December, but also the last video with the Christmas tree, Sad Times, and I can't quite believe this is real, it's the last video of 2021. I'm kind of mystified how we've got to 2022 so quickly like it's gone frightening fast and yet astonishingly slowly does anyone else feel like that anyway just to say uh before i get on with these books just one 2022 thing would you like me to do my best books of 2021 as a premiere if so let me know and i will make that happen tomorrow that's when um, i'm going to be sharing that video it's been recorded it was a difficult choice let's all move on because we're not in 2022 yet we haven't quite said goodbye to 2021 so let's do a little bit with this video where i wrap up the books from like i said the second half of december there's quite a few short books in here including <laughs> quite a few poetry collections and i'm not very good about talking about poetry so i'm a little bit nervous and uh, you know my history with wrap-ups in the last year it hasn't been good but i promise they'll be better next year anyway so the first book since i lasted a wrap-up which i'll link down below if you want to see my december wrap-up part one that i read was michaela cole's misfits a personal manifesto and this is based well Michaela Cole gave a, a lecture, a McTaggart lecture, which really inspired people on race, gender, working class, um, and looked at her life as a creator, what she's used from her life to create, including trauma. And this is a reworking of that with additional extras. And actually, at the beginning, I was a bit baffled by this book. So I was like, it's very much about moss, which comes to the gorgeous end papers. I know I talked about this in my um, books for Fiola, uh, Yola Bocaflot, which I realised I, I said the whole of that video wrong, where I talked about, um, I think it was 12 or 15 small short books that I recommended. I'll link that video down below if you want to see it. Anyway, um, it starts off looking at Moss and I was thinking, where's this going? And then it suddenly opens up and it's just brilliant. It's quite hard to read in parts. Um, Michaela Cole does look at trauma. I should say, if you don't know who Michaela Cole is, you need to watch I May Destroy You. It's really hard to watch, but it's incredible. And so is Chewing Gum, which is one of the other TV shows that she wrote and starred in. And um, she's phenomenal, I think. An incredible actress, incredible writer. And this shows off her writing. Again, it's very personal and yet open. Um, and yeah, I just thought this was a brilliant sort of pocketbook of power. That makes me think this for me was... Last year, the pocketbook of power, I think, was um, Elif Shafak's How to Stay Sane in Asia Vision. This is this year's book for me in that sort of pocket pocketbook of power genre. I'm, I've realised like I'm making up genres left, right and centre this year. It's ridiculous. Anyway, then I read The High House by Jesse Greengrass. Now, this was one that I read because it's on the Costa Book Award shortlist. I was going to make a video on all of the Costa Book Award shortlists, the fiction, well, not all of them, sorry, the fiction, the poetry and the debut, because I've read all of them in all those categories. The winners of those categories get announced next week. And Mum and I are going to be reading all five and then sort of picking which our winner is. Um, I think that'll be over on her channel. Um, but I wondered if you would still be interested once they've been announced, what my thoughts were on those 12 books. Let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see it. This was one of them, so I can go into more detail uh, in that video then if you'd like me to. But this is all about a place called The High House. Um, we're in the UK in the not too distant future where climate change has meant that there are floods. And we meet a young uh, girl who has, well, a young woman actually, who has, um, her father has met another woman. They're both really into um, taking action about the climate. Her stepmother's not particularly likeable, which is quite an interesting twist because she's kind of one of those people who you want to like because of all the stuff that she's doing that's so pro the planet. But um, yeah, she has layers. Um, and it's how the, she has a step um, brother um, and how that brings her close to her father. But then she's left with her step brother in the high house when the climate change emergency becomes a huge emergency. That happens very early on. So I feel like I've told a lot of story which actually does take much of the book up. And that's one thing that I thought was brilliant about the kickoff. Now I have to say, I've had a mixed relationship with Jessie Greengrass's books in the fact that her first 
short story collection, her first book, I thought was absolutely brilliant. And then I did not like her debut novel. This kind of falls somewhere in between because I liked a lot of it. I read it very quickly. I thought some of the characters were interesting, although I will say sometimes I couldn't work out who was talking or who we were meant to be in the mindset of. Now, I didn't know whether that was done on purpose because you're kind of we, we meet basically the high house a woman called Sally and her grandfather and Sally's kind of the caretaker we get to know more about her as we go along um but sometimes I couldn't differentiate the voices and that jarred with me a little bit or confused me a little bit and again I wasn't sure if it was meant to happen like I said or not um I think the way that Jesse Greengrass writes about the climate change was done brilliantly I was quite tense because of it um but yeah I think it's kind of for me, if I gave stars, which I don't tend to, this would be like a solid three, but I kind of really wanted it to be a four or a five because I think, I don't know whether I was putting all of my hopes in like, I haven't read many climate change novels. And so I think I was kind of putting everything in on this one, putting all my eggs in one basket as well, all my eggs in one book. Um, but yeah, it, it sort of delivered and sort of didn't. So, yeah, we have that one. Uh, then we have some of the Costa um, poetry. Now, in my last wrap-up, I forgot to talk about Eat or We Both Starve by Victoria Kinefic, um, which is her debut poetry collection, and this is up for the Costa um, Poetry Award. And this is a fantastic collection. I thought this was brilliant. It looks at eating, and there's one brilliant poem called Diet, which I don't think I'm going to forget. Um, it looks at consumption but also then goes out into some sort of more about family and about um, there's some stuff about religion here um victoria is um, an irish author so some of the sort of history of ireland comes to the fore i'll be talking about that more a little bit with another book um and yeah i thought this was brill i um would like to read this again actually and i think that's something that i'm going to do with a lot of the poetry that i've read this year i think sometimes i can't work out i'm not very good with poetry so i can't work out whether it's good to like sort of binge a poetry collection or dip in and out as you go a bit like short stories although short stories sometimes I can binge a whole collection and read them instead of a novel but maybe what I'm planning to do with short stories next year I should do with poetry and sort of pace them a little bit better what's your advice if you're a big poetry reader and um, let me know in the comments below but yeah I, um, I thought this was really 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 good as I did uh, Raymond Antrobus's All the Names Given and I really really loved Raymond's first collection um, The Perseverance I thought that was absolutely phenomenal it looks at the deaf experience it looks at the relationship between him and his father it looks at his family history and this is kind of an extension of that um but kind of it makes it sound like he's sort of working with the same ground and he isn't he looks at like names and he looks at the sort of things we inherit historically or the things that we sort of take on that we that's maybe sort of more uh less a person's actual history but actually history and how people are seen and perceived in history does that make sense probably not because i find poetry difficult to talk about and this is making me squirm want to stop recording and start again but i won't i'm going to carry on um so yeah i thought it was great um and like i said it, it was an extension of the perseverance so some of the there's more about um him and his father but at the same time we go up and find more about um his mother's side of the family and yeah i just thought it was a really 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 great poetry collection as I did, there's a theme coming, three great poetry collections on the trot. Um, the Kids by Hannah Lowe, which I hadn't heard about until it was on. Um, this was one that I was uh, highly anticipating, I should say. And actually this one I hadn't heard about either. And that's one thing that I do love about prizes when they introduce you to books that you've not um, heard of before. It's very, very exciting. I find that a real thrill. Anyway, this is The Kids by Hannah Lowe. And this is all about being a teacher. And Hello has been, or even she may even still be a teacher in inner city London. And she writes about that experience as a teacher. She writes some poetry sort of from the people that she's taught this perspective. Now, if that's reminding you of a certain author this year who's been absolutely like, well, not great. This is the complete opposite. This feels so real and is not done in any um this isn't somebody sort of cashing in on talking about younger people and gender and race and all those things. This is about somebody who is listening to the voices of the generations that she has taught and then kind of giving that back in sort of sonnet form. 
how I feel like I know what I'm talking about briefly. Um, and um, yeah, I thought this was great, but also she writes about the teachers that she had. And uh, yeah, we all, we've all had really good teachers, I'm sure, and also really bad teachers, I'm sure. But um, yeah, this is, I just thought was ace. And um, as my mum being a teacher, I really want her to read it because um, I think she'll get a lot out of it. Actually, my sister is trying to be a teacher, so maybe she will too. Then the penultimate book, of uh, December and indeed 2021. Although I think I read a, did I read a couple of these after if I just put those all together because they're on the cost list, I should say. And I have it in front of me because I've just taken my um, picture of all of my books that I read in December for my December wrap up on Instagram. Uh, this is the fourth book that is up for the um, Costa Poetry Award. It's Keo Chingonyi's um, A Blood Condition. Also really, really, really brilliant. I talked about that in the other uh, December wrap up that I mentioned and like I said I'll link that down below. Anyway, so I was in the mood to read something Christmassy uh, after the, uh, well after reading I think it was Juno Dawson's Stay Another Day just put me in a real Christmas spirit and this book I'd seen getting rave reviews it's Claire Keegan's Small Things Like These. Now this is set in Ireland in the, I'm going to get the date wrong now aren't I, 1980s, it's in 1985 and um, it's about a man who we meet who is living in this Irish town. Uh, we get to know more about him and how he, uh, nobody knew who his father was. His mother had him when she was quite young. They were both poor, but they were taken in by the people in the big house. And it's how his life has been since then. He's got a wife, he's got children. But at the same time, we're also hearing about um, some of the local buildings in the area and um, one particularly which is um, a religious building and I kind of want to stop here because I think partly for me what slightly ruined this book if I'm honest was the fact that and this is where I feel awful because I've seen nothing but praise for this book but it left me quite cold maybe I just have a heart of coal I don't know or, or an icicle instead or something whatever let's not go down too many analogies around Christmas because next thing I'll be saying is I've got a Christmas tree in there and that's just after that I am wearing Christmas tree colours moving on Simon move on um so not that Christmas tree clearly <laughs> um so um th there's a uh is it a, no, a dedication in this book and I won't say who it's to but basically it gives away what the book is really about and so that took an element of I think I'm not going to say surprise because it isn't a pleasant surprise but I have just said surprise and um, it kind of for me gave away what what we were going to be reading about and so the effect of what happened and how Claire Keegan puts these characters together that we get to know more about as we go along kind of fell for me but also I felt like it was a little bit in trying to be a master of this story of this one man who I still in my head call furlough and that is not right I think it was fur... it sounds like furlough oh why can't I find it? it's gonna annoy me now um let me find the furlong but I kept thinking in my head furlough unfortunate naming there um but but as she's trying to create this sort of character study of furlong and how he's become the man he is and then also this really big part of irish history i felt like trying to master both of them she kind of by default became a master of neither because they were just both a bit too vague not quite drawn enough and because it's such a short sharp book i kind of feel like it needed to be even further focused on one or the other and how they intertwined which it builds and builds more towards the end. It's one of those books where the end is kind of the big payoff. But then if you've read the dedication, the payoff is lessened. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on that one. Now, I have to admit, I have not finished this yet. I have about 100 pages to go. But I'm recording this um, at about three o'clock on um, New Year's Eve. And so I'm hoping to get it done uh, by the end of today because it's going to be a late night because I am going to stay up till midnight because I just always do, even though... I would quite like to be asleep as the clock struck midnight, I don't know. I just always feel like I have to welcome a new year in and kind of say, in this case, sod off to the previous one. Sorry, 2021, but you've not been the best uh, for just general-wise, life-wise, reading-wise, as we'll talk about next week um, and more. Anyway, the book that I'm hoping to read the final 100 pages of and be able to talk to you about more in because course, although I'm actually making a reading vlog as I read this, I was going to try and read a few books I was looking forward to in 2022, but this is so blinking huge, not happened. 
I am teasing you right now. It is To Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara. And um, I feel like this is the pristine hardback that I've not touched. I've been carrying around the proof with me all week and it is battered, it is dog-eared, it's had its spine cracked because um, I was firmly in the really thought a little life was quite brilliant camp. I know that there's a lot of people who think it's an awful book and that's what's great about books. We'll have different opinions, but we can talk about it and how lovely. Um, so I have been so excited for this and I... It hasn't let me down at all, but it is such a different book, which one is brilliant because it shows that Hany Anagahara is a very diverse author, because actually this book is kind of like three books in one. So without giving too much away, which you almost sort of, it's harder to do, especially because there's three books within the book. So the first book is uh, called Washington Square and it's set in the 1890s in a kind of alternate uh, New York. And it reads very much like, I kept thinking of House of Mirth, the language wise, not, not necessarily the storyline. Um, but yeah, I had that House of Mirth, like queer House of Mirth, Edith Wharton vibes. And it certainly made me want to read a lot of Edith Wharton again. Um, as we meet um, David, who's living with his grandfather. Um, and he, we start with a scene where the family are gathered to decide what's going to happen with the estate once the, once their grandfather dies because the Binghams are a big family in America and we follow as David gets into an arranged marriage with another man and um, what is brilliant about this segment without giving anything away is that there becomes a tryst and there becomes like this real love triangle going on but also you start to see that in this progressive sort of version of 1893 there's actually some really unprogressive things going on and the world is not what it first appears I thought that was brilliant um, and I just love the writing the second part of the book takes place in 1993 where we meet a queer couple and they're having a party with one of their friends who is dying he's dying of cancer but it's during the AIDS epidemic so it's kind of looking at all of that as well as this couple one of whom is younger and one is much older and um that's the first part of that book. Then we meet one of their fathers who may or may not be related from a king in Hawaii. Now that takes a bit of a leap. And I have to say that segment, I was really sad about it because I thought the way it looked at uh, colonialization, the way it looked at cultural appropriation, the way it looked at race um, and class was fascinating. But the actual story, I didn't really get. Whereas then when we move into um, the third book, um, which is, I want to say, called State 8, but I don't think that's right. Let me just know, because I've not told you the title of the second book either. The second book is called Lipo Weo Nahale, and then the third book is called Zone 8. I'm sorry, it's not 08, Zone 8. Um, we are in 2093, and I will, st and this happens early on, we realise, we, we meet someone, a nameless narrator, who is working in New York in the future, and they're working in a lab, um, on mice, and I kept thinking of Transcendent Kingdom when it opened, actually. Um, but we, and we get glimpses of this kind of dystopic world, which is quite sinister and scary, and everybody really wants to be outside. And then we realise that they work on um, science, well, they work on mice to move science forward with pandemics. And it describes um, minor pandemics of 1918 and 2020 and the ones that were worse afterwards. I'm only putting this, I'm only letting you know this because it's not a spoiler because you find that out early on, but also if that's the triggering subject for you, this is not going to be the book for you. I'm actually finding that section absolutely enthralling and absolutely terrifying as I'm reading it. And it's sort of, yeah, it's quite a lot to take in, but it's incredibly powerful and sort of looks at the world now, but obviously, in a future that hasn't happened yet. And there's this kind of weird looking back, not nostalgia, but hindsight um, to it, which I think is quite incredible. And also there's this lovely alta alternating section um, where we get letters from the past and we sort of see how the pandemics from about 2030 come in these kind of waves more and more and how there's one scientist actually who kind of is waiting for the big one because they feel like their work's gonna go so much more forward. Anyway, what the book kind of, the similarities to um, A Little Life are, it's very much a book about, I'm really talking about this book. You're practically getting like, well, I talk about it in much more detail in the vlog that's coming um, on Sunday or Monday, Sunday. Um, 
um, which I haven't quite finished yet, but I'm hoping to finish by midnight tonight. Um, anyway, uh, you, what, where this is similar to A Little Life is the lack of communication between men. That's a really, really big theme in the book. So is uh, the queer community. It's a very um, pro-queer book, which I love. And I think there's something that Hany Anakara does with her writing. She, she really, you know, she is a huge, huge supporter of the queer community and, and writes, I think, almost too well on some bits. There's, there's one bit in the first part of the book where one of the characters behaves in a certain way that is quite difficult to read, but I know I've behaved like that. And that's something that I think she's very, very, very good at, is kind of observing the human condition and how humans behave, be it in 1893, 1993 or 2093. Um, but also it's very much about utopia and um, colonization and what what is paradise to who. Um, which the title slightly gives it away, but I didn't spot that until I've got a tiny way into it. Um, but that's not a spoiler either because I've been so vague. But the thing I was going to say is I can't talk about characters because the same names recur in the three different parts. So yeah, but I will say like, I don't think this is going to be a five star for me because I just sort of don't give stars, but I do because like on, you know, certain um, book bookish words, I'm leaving Goodreads. Well, not leaving. Well, I am leaving because I'm leaving it. I'm updating it. And if you see it and you think, Simon, you didn't read those in those dates. I'm literally, I stopped doing it months ago. And so I'm having to go back through the pictures that I put on Instagram to work out what I read and just sort of making the dates up just so that I can then transfer over to Storygraph fully. Anyway, waffling on. Um, but, and I think it's just because of that one part where I was just like, this isn't working for me. And it was a difficult, like 200 pages to read. I did feel like I was sort of, trudging through it a little bit um it just felt like so much was trying to be crammed in it almost needed to be a book of its own but i don't know if i would have been that interested if that had been the book unlike with the first part of the book which i could literally read if hani anagahara wants to do a series of like books based on the different characters in that i would happily read it um as i would actually the third segment too um which also shows the diversity of her writing because at the beginning, like I said, it's like this queer Edith Wharton vibe. And then in the middle, you've got this kind of, there is a 90s style to it, a bit like Evan White writes and a bit like, yeah. But then um, there is this kind of dystopic that did remind me a little bit of Atwood and yeah, um, brill so far. Um, but like I said, not perfect, but I wasn't expecting it to be 100%. So yeah, it, a little life, I don't know, you, it's... I, I feel like I want to compare the two and you can't because they're just so totally and utterly bloody brilliantly different. So there we are. That is my final wrap up of 2021. Thank you all so much for watching. If you've watched this far, leave me a firework emoji. But um, just thank you so much for watching throughout the last year. Your chats, your comments just have meant a lot to me um, and it has really helped me. I've been getting quite a few messages from people saying thank you this channel was really really helpful which i find really lovely humbling and very odd all at once um but how it's, it's helped people get through 2021 and i just want to say the feeling is mutual you have really really helped me get through 2021 too um but here's to 2022 i hope you all have a fantastic happy wonderful new year here's to lots more chatting about books over the forthcoming 12 months who knows what reading adventures we're going to be going on i am so excited and like i said i'll be back tomorrow with my books of 2021 and savage Reads will have a slightly new look get ready for a new banner i think i've changed my thumbnail picture already and I'll be changing the style of my thumbnails and I'm not going to change it after that. It's going to be what they are for the year because I've overthought thumbnails and there's just no point. But I'm hoping to do some new jingly jangly music. Anyway, I could waffle on for hours, clearly. Um, but I will speak to you all tomorrow. And let me know, like I said in the comments down below, if you would like me to do a premiere of my books of the year so that you can watch along. I will speak to you all then. Bye. Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year.